The Battle of Buna Gona was part of the New Guinea campaign in the Pacific Theater during World War II. It followed the conclusion of the Kokoda Track campaign and lasted from 16 November 1942 until 22 January 1943. The battle was fought by Australian and United States forces against the Japanese beachheads at Buna, Sanananda, and Gona. From these, the Japanese had launched an overland attack on Port Moresby. In light of developments in the Solomon Islands campaign, Japanese forces approaching Port Moresby were ordered to withdraw to and secure these bases on the northern coast. Australian forces maintained contact as the Japanese conducted a well-ordered rearguard action. The Allied objective was to eject the Japanese forces from these positions and deny them their further use. The Japanese forces were skillful, well-prepared and resolute in their defense. They had developed a strong network of well-concealed defenses. Operations in Papua and New Guinea were severely hampered by terrain, vegetation, climate, disease and the lack of infrastructure, these imposed significant logistical limitations. During the Kokoda Track campaign, these factors applied more or less equally to both belligerents but favored the defender in attacks against well-fortified positions. The battlefield and logistical constraints limited the applicability of conventional allied doctrine of maneuver and firepower. During the opening stages of the offensive, the Allies faced a severe shortage of food and ammunition. This problem was never entirely resolved. The battle also exposed critical problems with the suitability and performance of Allied equipment. The combat effectiveness of U.S. forces, particularly the U.S. 32nd Division, has been severely criticized. These factors were compounded by repeated demands from General Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in the Southwest Pacific Area, for a rapid conclusion to the battle. The demands were more to politically secure MacArthur's command than for any strategic need. In consequence, troops were hastily committed to battle on repeated occasions, increasing Allied losses and ultimately lengthening the battle. Allied air power interrupted the Japanese capacity to reinforce and resupply the beachheads from Rabaul. This ultimately made the Japanese position untenable. There was widespread evidence of the Japanese defenders cannibalizing the dead. In the closing stages of the battle, significant numbers of the defenders were withdrawn by sea or escaped overland toward the west and the Japanese base around Salamua and Leh. The remaining garrison fought to the death, almost to the man. The resolve and tenacity of the Japanese in defense was unprecedented, and had not previously been encountered. It was to mark the desperate nature of fighting that characterized battles for the remainder of the Pacific War. For the Allies, there were a number of valuable but costly lessons in the conduct of jungle warfare. Allied losses in the battle were at a rate higher than that experienced at Guadalcanal. For the first time, the American public was confronted with the images of dead American troops. Chapter 1 Background Japan's entry into World War II and the war in the Pacific commenced with the attack on Pearl Harbor on 7 December 1941, which was coordinated with closely coinciding attacks on Thailand, the Philippines, the American bases on Guam and Wake Island, and the British possessions of Malaya, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Japanese forces rapidly secured territory in Southeast Asia, the East Indies, and the Central and Southwest Pacific. Australia had been shocked by the speedy collapse of British Malaya, and the fall of Singapore. With the fall, nearly 15,000 Australian soldiers became prisoners of war along with the rest of the garrison of some 85,000. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt ordered General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines to formulate a Pacific defense plan with Australia in March 1942. The Australian Prime Minister, John Curtin, agreed to place Australian forces under the command of MacArthur, who became Supreme Commander, Southwest Pacific Area. MacArthur moved his headquarters to Melbourne in March 1942. The Japanese assaulted Rabaul on 23 January 1942. Rabaul became the forward base for the Japanese campaigns in mainland New Guinea. 
Japanese forces first landed on the mainland of New Guinea on 8 March 1942 when they invaded Leh and Salamua to secure bases for the defense of the important base they were developing at Rabao. The Japanese 17th Army under Lt. Gen. Harukichi Hyakutake was a core sized command involved in the New Guinea, Guadalcanal, and Solomon Islands campaigns. The Japanese 8th Area Army, under General Hitoshi Imamura, was mobilized to take overall command in the areas from 16 November 1942. It was responsible for both the New Guinea and Solomon Islands campaigns. Imamura was based at Rabaul. The Japanese 18th Army, under Lt. Gen. Hatazo Adachi, was also formed to take over responsibilities for Japanese operations on mainland New Guinea, leaving the 17th Army responsible for the Solomon Islands. Despite Australian fears, the Japanese never intended to invade the Australian mainland. While an invasion was considered by the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters in February 1942, it was judged to be beyond the capability of the Japanese military and no planning or other preparations were undertaken. Instead, in March 1942 the Japanese adopted a strategy of isolating Australia from the United States, planning to capture Port Moresby in the territory of Papua, and the Solomon Islands, Fiji, Samoa, and New Caledonia. The first part of this plan, codenamed Operation Mo, was an amphibious landing to capture Port Moresby, capital of the Australian territory of Papua. This was frustrated by the Japanese defeat in the Battle of the Coral Sea and postponed indefinitely after the Battle of Midway. The Japanese then planned an overland attack to capture the town by advancing from the north coast. Having already captured much of the territory of New Guinea earlier that year, they landed on 21 July 1942, to establish beachheads at Buna, Gona, and Sananander. This marked the beginning of the Kokoda Track campaign. The South Seas Detachment, under command of Major General Tomitaro Harai, advanced using the Kokoda Track to cross the rugged Owen Stanley Range. As the Kokoda Track campaign was taking place, a Japanese invasion force made up of Japanese Special Naval Landing Force units attempted to capture the strategically valuable Milne Bay area in August 1942. The Battle of Milne Bay, fought from 25 August to 7 September 1942 resulted in a Japanese defeat. This was the first notable Japanese land defeat and raised Allied morale across the Pacific theater. Allied forces identified a Japanese airfield under construction at Guadalcanal, and 19,000 U.S. Marines were embarked to capture the airfield. An amphibious landing was made on 7 August. The battle lasted until 9 February 1943 and was strongly contested, on land, at sea and in the air. By the 16th of September, Harai's force had advanced as far as Ioribiwa, 20 miles from Port Moresby, and was close enough to see the town's lights. In light of reverses at Guadalcanal, Lieutenant General Harukichi Hyakutake determined he could not support both battles and on 23 September, ordered Harai to withdraw his troops on the Kokoda track, until the issue at Guadalcanal was decided. Limited provision had been made for the supply of Harai's force. The situation had reached a crisis. There were also concerns that Allied forces might land at Buna at any time. On 26 September, the Japanese began to withdraw. They fought a well-ordered rearguard action back over the Owen Stanley Range, with the Australian 7th Division in close pursuit. The US 32nd Infantry Division, had been sent to New Guinea in September and was ordered to make a circling move against the Japanese eastern flank near Weiropi. This move commenced on 14 October. These plans were rendered ineffectual by the rate of the Japanese withdrawal but it left the division well positioned to coordinate its advance on the beachheads with the Australians that were approaching from the southwest. Major General Arthur Allen was controversially relieved of command of the 7th Division on 28 October, and replaced by Major General George Vasey, previously commander of the 6th Division. Harai's force had been severely depleted by the lack of supplies but at Oivi it was replenished and reinforced. The Japanese suffered heavy casualties in the battle around Oivi Garari, from 4 to 11 November. The well-ordered withdrawal, that had been planned quickly disintegrated into a rout. 
The 7th Division was about 40 miles from Buna Gona. Although experience demanded caution, the way before them was clear of Japanese forces. Chapter 2 Geography Chapter 2 Section 1 Climate and Terrain The Japanese beachheads from which the Kokoda campaign was launched were located about three key positions along a 16 mile stretch of the north coast of New Guinea, Gona to the west. Buna to the east and Sanananda Juru were in the center. Roughly 100 miles northeast of Port Moresby, it approximates to the most direct line from there to the north coast. The settlements are located on a thin coastal strip that separates the sea from a tidal forest swamp of mangroves, Nipa and Sago. Rivers flowing across the broad, flat, coastal plain from the Owen Stanley Range disappear into the swamps, and discharge to the sea through many coastal creeks. The coastal strip is rarely more than a few hundred yards at its widest, to little more than a footpad separating the swamp from the sea. The few paths through the swamp were seldom more than twelve foot wide. The area is low lying and featureless, Buna airstrip is five feet above sea level. The elevation is only double this at Soputa, 7.5 miles inland and 280 feet at Popandetta. 13 miles inland. The water table is reportedly shallow at about 3 feet. This affected the digging of weapons pits and construction of defensive positions. Areas not waterlogged were either dense jungle or swathes of kunai grass. Coconut plantations filled the wider areas of dry ground along the coastal strip, but had been neglected and undergrowth had reclaimed the ground. The dense kunai grass could grow to six feet and the leaves were broad and sharp. Temperatures over the period of the battle ranged from 72 to 89 degrees Fahrenheit but with a humidity of 82 percent, this could be oppressive. In the humid conditions, kunai grass trapped the heat and it was not uncommon for temperatures to reach 122 degrees Fahrenheit. The battle was conducted during the tropical wet season. Average rainfall for December was 14.5 inches, although this figure does not lend itself to a full appreciation of the impact of rain. It was characterized by heavy tropical storms, usually in the afternoon. While the worst of the monsoon held off until after the battle, rain was nonetheless a prevalent feature of the battle. Lieutenant General Robert L. Eichelberger wrote, at Buna that year it rained about 170 inches. I have found out since that we got more than our share in December and January 1942-43. Daily rainfall totals of 8 to 10 inches were not uncommon. Under these conditions, the few tracks, seldom more than foot trails, quickly became boggy. Chapter 2 Section 2 Disease The area was one of the most malarial regions in the world. While malaria was the greatest disease threat, other tropical diseases such as dengue fever, scrub typhus, tropical ulcers, dysentery from a range of causes and fungal infections were common. The impact and susceptibility to disease was exacerbated by a poor and insufficient diet. While the Australian army had encountered malaria in the Middle East, few doctors with the militia had seen the disease before. Supplies of quinine, which was still the primary drug in use, were unreliable. Atabrin only became the official suppressive drug used by the Australian forces in late December 1942, and the change to its use was not immediate. The need for a strict anti-malaria program, was not fully understood. Many officers saw this as a medical rather than a disciplinary issue and, did not compel their men to take their medicine. It was common for Australian soldiers to wear shorts and rolled sleeves in response to the oppressive heat. Mosquito nets and repellent were in short supply, while the repellent that was supplied was considered ineffective. Bergerud states that 85 to 95 percent of all Allied soldiers in the area carried malaria during the battle. There were 4.8 men hospitalized through sickness for one Allied battle casualty. 75% of the cases were attributed to malaria. After he had relieved Harding, Eichelberger gave orders to take the temperature of an entire company near the front. Every member of that company was running a fever. By necessity, 
Many men remained in the front lines with fevers up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Breen reports, Japanese accounts of the prevalence of disease are similarly shocking. Chapter 3, Logistics For Allied forces and the Japanese, the Battle of Bunagona was largely determined by logistics and limitations of supply. Approaching the beachheads, it was necessary for Allied forces to rely on airdrops. There was a high rate of loss and breakage, up to 50%. From almost the outset of the battle, the Allies faced critical shortages of ammunition and rations. Once the Allied forces had formed up on the Japanese positions, landing strips were quickly developed to support the engaging forces. This eliminated the losses associated with air dropping but the supply situation was consistently compromised by poor weather over the air route, and a lack of transport aircraft. A sea route was gradually surveyed to nearby Oro Bay, which was to be developed as a port in support of the Allied operations. The first large vessel to deliver supplies to Oro Bay was the SS Karsik on the night 11-12 December. Following this, regular convoys under Operation Lilliput commenced. Lilliput greatly increased the tonnage of material supplied to the Allied forces but much of it was consumed by increases in the size of the force. The level of supply never reached the point where it ceased to be an extraordinarily difficult problem. The Japanese fighting along the Kokoda track faced the same logistical problems as the Australians but lacked the benefit of air supply to any significant extent. Stocks of rice and other foodstuffs identified at Ghana when it was captured on 8 December suggest that the garrison had been well provisioned at the start of the battle. The Japanese positions had been supplied by sea from Rabaul but attempts at the start of the battle to land troops and supplies from destroyers were only partly successful. Allied air power at Rabaul and over the beachheads curtailed the use of surface ships for supply. Some troops and equipment destined for Buna Gona were landed near the mouth of the Mambere River. Reinforcements and supplies were barged to the beachheads from there. Some supplies were landed from submarines, although size and travel time dictated that the quantities were necessarily small. On the night of 25 December, a Japanese submarine unloaded supplies and ammunition at Buna Government Station, the last time the Japanese received supplies. There was limited use of aerial resupply by the Japanese at Buna Gona. The normal rice ration was 28 ounces. Rice formed the bulk of the Japanese ration. At the end of December, each man received around 360 milliliters of rice per day but this was reduced to 40 to 80 milliliters in early January. There was no food for the period 8 to 12 January. By the time that the battle was over on the 22nd of January, the garrison had been virtually starved into submission, and there was evidence that the Japanese had resorted to cannibalizing the dead. Chapter 4, Japanese Forces the Japanese positions in the Buna Gona area were manned by naval and army units. The naval units included the 5th Special Landing Party, the equivalent of Marines. Forces withdrawing down the Kokoda track added to the strength of the original garrison. Many survivors of the Kokoda campaign congregated to the west, near the mouth of the Kumasi River and linked up with Japanese reinforcements that were landed there in early December. This force actively threatened the western flank of the Australians at Ghana. Sources generally quote the Japanese effective strength at the start of the battle as 5,500 or 6,500 after reinforcement on the night of the 18th of November. Milner observes, no precise figure can be given for Japanese strength at the beachhead in mid-November. Sources give the total of Japanese forces deployed to Buna Gona or operating to the west in the vicinity of the Kumasi and Membere rivers from 11,000 to 12,000. Between 1,000 and 1,500 troops were landed by destroyer on 17 and the 18th of November, just before the Allied forces reached the beachhead positions. Bullard records the landing at Basabu of 800 reinforcements for the South Seas force on the evening of 21 November. 
On 29th of November 400 to 500 of the troops that had withdrawn along the Kamasi River and concentrated near its mouth were barged to San Ananda. The position at Buna to the Jurua River was held by between 2,000 and 2,500 troops. Ghana was held by 800 to 900 defenders. Sources record that the Japanese forces in front of San Ananda numbered between 4,000 and 5,500 including troops in hospital. Defenders on the Sananada track are included as part of the strength of the Sananada Jurua position. From 1,700 to 1,800 held the defenses on the track. Four more attempts were made by destroyer convoys to reinforce the beachheads. Convoys on the 28th of November and the 9th of December were turned back by air attacks. A convoy on the 2nd of December, after an aborted attempt at Basabua, landed about 500 troops, mainly the 3rd-170 th battalion, near the mouth of the Kumasi River. On 12th of December 800 troops, mainly of the I-170 th battalion, were landed near the mouth of the Mambare River, further along the coast. Part of this force was moved to reinforce the 3rd-170 th battalion operating against the flank at Ghana. Between 700 and 800 reached Jurua from 26 to 31 December. Harai, who had led the attack across the Kokoda track, drowned at sea on 19 November after rafting down the Kumasi River during the withdrawal from Kokoda. Colonel Yosuke Yokoyama temporarily assumed command of the South Seas Force following Harai's death. Major General Kensuku Order succeeded Harai in command of the South Seas Force. Major General Tsuyuo Yamagata commanded the 21st Independent Mixed Brigade and was given command of all 18th Army units in the area other than the South Seas Force. He landed near the Kumasi River on 2 December and reached Kona on 6 December, when he was given command of the Japanese units engaged in the battle. The Japanese defensive positions at Buna, Gona and forward at the Sananander track junction had been strongly developed before the arrival of Allied forces. They have been described as some of the strongest encountered by the Allies in the course of the war. They made excellent use of terrain, which limited the tactical possibilities for attackers and consisted of hundreds of bunkers and machine gun emplacements developed in depth. Individual positions were mutually supporting and alternative positions were used to confound attackers. Chapter 5 Allied Forces the Allied advance on the Japanese positions at Buna Gona was made by the 16th and 25th Brigades of the Australian 7th Division and the 126th and 128th Infantry Regiments of the US 32nd Infantry Division. During the course of the battle, a further four infantry brigades, two infantry regiments and an armoured squadron of 19 M3 Stuart tanks were deployed. Australian units were generally well below establishment. American forces arrived on the battlefield with a force much closer to establishment. The Papuan Infantry Battalion patrolled in the vicinity for Japanese stragglers from the Kokoda Track campaign but was not engaged directly in the battle. The contribution of Papuans engaged as laborers or porters was a significant part of the Allied logistic effort. More than 3,000 Papuans worked to support the Allies during the battle. Significant criticism has been leveled at the combat effectiveness of U.S. troops, specifically the 32nd Division, within the U.S. command and in subsequent histories. A lack of training is most often cited in defense of their performance. Several historians have also commented on the lack of training afforded Australian militia units engaged in the battle although some had the benefit of a stiffening of experienced junior officers posted to them from the Australian Imperial Force. Before the Allied forces arrived on the Boonagona coast, Richard K. Sutherland, then Major General and MacArthur's Chief of Staff, had glibly referred to the Japanese coastal fortifications as hasty field entrenchments. The strength and combat effectiveness of the Japanese defenders was severely underestimated. Maps of the area were inaccurate and lacked detail. Aerial photos were not generally available to commanders in the field. Allied command had failed to make effective provision for supply of artillery or tanks, believing quite mistakenly that air support could replace them. 
Allied commanders in the field were unable to provide fire support capable of suppressing Japanese positions sufficient for infantry to close with and overwhelm them. Logistical limitations constrained efforts to make good these deficiencies. Scanty and inaccurate intelligence led MacArthur to believe that Buna could be taken with relative ease. MacArthur never visited the front during the campaign. He had no understanding of the conditions faced by his commanders and troops, yet he continued to interfere and pressure them to achieve unrealistic results. Terrain and persistent pressure for haste meant that there was little, if any, time given for reconnaissance. MacArthur's pressure has been described as lengthening the battle and increasing the number of casualties. Chapter 6 Battle The battle started on 16 November, when the Australian 7th Division crossed the Kumasi River, about 40 miles from the beachheads, in pursuit of the withdrawing Japanese forces. On the eve of 19 November, the 25th Brigade was advancing toward Ghana, along the track from Jumura, while the 16th Brigade was advancing toward Sanananda on the track from Soputa. The American 126th Regiment was placed under command of 7th Division to protect its eastern flank. The 32nd Division was approaching Buna along the coastal route and along the track from Simami. Harding prepared to attack positions at the eastern end of the Buna defenses in the vicinity of the landing strip and the plantation. Attacks were launched on 19 November, using the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 128th Infantry Regiment. On the same day, the 25th Brigade, approaching Ghana, made contact with defended positions placed along its line of advance. The 16th Brigade, approaching Sanananda, made contact the following day. Up to that point, there had been only limited and light contact with the Japanese defenders as the Australians approached the beachheads. It had been the same for the 32nd Division. This situation quickly changed as the attacking forces met with stiff resistance. The conventional doctrine of maneuver and fire support was negated by terrain, a lack of heavy weapons and supply shortages. Difficulties were compounded by the determination of the Japanese fighting from well-prepared defensive positions. Despite repeated attacks over the next two weeks, the Allies made little progress and were faced with mounting casualties. The conditions were likened to a tropical vignette of the trench warfare conditions of the earlier war. The 2nd Battalion, 126th Regiment was returned to command of 32nd Division on the 22nd of November, while the 3rd Battalion was tasked to secure the Sokuta Sananander Cape Killerton Track Junction, to the front of the 16th Brigade. On the 30th of November, after nearly a week of indecisive skirmishing through the bush, the position which was to become well known as Huggins Roadblock was established on the Sananander Track, just south of the 2nd Cape Killerton Track Junction. The position was manned by these occupiers until relieved on the 22nd of December by the 39th Battalion. Wedged between the Japanese positions astride the track, it compromised the line of communication to the forward Japanese positions, however, its own position was equally tenuous. The Japanese forward positions were enveloped but not sealed. By concentrating reinforcements, the Japanese position at Gona was finally cleared on the morning of the 9th of December. The position was threatened by Japanese forces that had landed at the mouth of the Kumasi River and fighting continued west of Gona Creek for some time. Attacking the Buna area from both flanks, American forces entered Buna village on the 14th of December but a virtual stalemate developed on the eastern flank. This was relieved by the arrival of the Australian 18th Brigade and Stuart tanks of 2 6th Armoured Regiment. With an attack on 18 December, steady progress thereafter followed. By 3 January, the Boona area, as far as the Jiroa River, had been cleared. The Australian 7th Division continued to pressure the forward Japanese positions astride the Sanananda track without a decisive result, despite reinforcements and redeploying units that had been fighting at Gona. Figures prepared by HQ 7th Division showed that, from 25 November to 23 December, the division had received 4,273 troops to replace 5,905 lost to its front from all causes. Thus Vasey's force was about 1,632 weaker than at the outset. 
As December closed, there was no prospect of the division being reinforced by further Australian units but the 163rd Infantry of the US 41st Division, had been ordered to New Guinea and arrived at Port Moresby on 27 December, to be placed under command of 7th Division. After the fall of Boona, the 32nd Division was to advance on the main San Ananda position from the east. On 12 January, the Japanese positions south of Huggins were attacked by the 18th Brigade without success. Following this, Vasey made an appreciation of the situation. These observations, while made in response to the attack on the 12th, exemplify the conditions under which the battle was conducted. As a result of the attack by 18 Austin on 12 Jan 43, it is now clear that the present position which has been held by the Japs since 20th of November 42 consists of a series of perimeter localities in which there are numerous pillboxes of the same type as those found in the Buna area. To attack these with infantry using their own weapons is repeating the costly mistakes of 1915-17 and, in view of the limited resources which can be, at present, put into the field in this area, such attacks seem unlikely to succeed. The nature of the ground prevents the use of tanks except along the main San Ananda track on which the enemy has already shown that, that he has ATK guns capable of knocking out the M3 light tank. Owing to the denseness of the undergrowth in the area of Ops, these pillboxes are only discovered at very short ranges, and it is therefore not possible to subject them to arty bombardment without withdrawing our own troops. Experience has shown that when our troops are withdrawn to permit of such bombardment, the Jap occupies the vacated territory so that the bombardment, apart from doing him little damage, only produces new positions out of which the Jap must be driven. The problem of the forward positions on the main track was resolved by the Japanese withdrawing over the next two nights and the positions were occupied by the evening of the 14th. The 18th Brigade quickly advanced on Cape Killerton and then San Ananda. A link was established with the 32nd Division at Jerua on the 21st of January. The battle concluded on the 22nd of January, but there were still many Japanese roaming the area. The Japanese had planned for evacuation of the area, but this was overtaken by the rate of the Allied advance. About 1,200 sick and wounded were evacuated by sea from 13 to 20 January. On the 20th of January, Yamagata ordered an evacuation and on the night of the 21st of January, large sections of the force still remaining in the area began to break away in accordance with their orders. About 1,000 escaped overland to the west of Ghana but Japanese sources suggest this may be as high as 1,900. Chapter 6, Section 1, Advance on Buna, Warren Force The Buna area, to be taken by the 32nd Division, stretched from the Duropa Plantation in the east, to Buna Village, at the mouth of the Jurua River, in the west. This strip of coast is about 5,700 yards from end to end. The Jurua River formed the operational boundary with 7th Division. The firmer ground and defended positions were widest at each end, about 1,600 yards at the eastern end and a little less at the other end. With a narrower strip in between, it has some resemblance to a dog's bone. The inland side of the eastern end is defined by two landing strips. The old strip runs roughly parallel to the coast and with Simami Creek, which flows along the seaward edge of the strip. This creek represented an obstacle for attacking troops. Dispersal bays had been constructed at the eastern end of the old strip, and along the seaward side. While not actually joined, the two strips formed a wide corner. The Simami Creek passed between the two strips. A bridge on the track to Simami crossed the creek there. The bridge was 125 feet long and had a section blown from one end. The new strip was actually a decoy strip. The ground was unsuitable for developing as a landing strip. The Duropa Coconut Plantation occupied most of the ground around Cape Endiadea north of the eastern end of the new strip. A track approached Cape Endiadea, along the coast from Hariko, to the southeast. At the eastern end, the Japanese occupied the Duropa Plantation, from the new strip, blocking the approach by the coastal route. 
they also blocked the approach from Simami, with positions forward of the bridge. At the western end of the Buna area, a track led from Buna village and the Buna government station inland to Ango. The position that came to be known as the Triangle was a salient protruding from the Japanese defensive line. It straddled the track just inland of where the track branched to either the village or station. The government station is sometimes incorrectly referred to as the Buna Mission. Entrance Creek separated the station from the village. On the track to the village, a footbridge crossed Entrance Creek a short distance from the track junction. The coconut grove lay along the track to Buna village, after crossing Entrance Creek. To the northeast of the triangle was the open area of the government gardens, which had formerly been cultivated. The government plantation, a coconut grove, occupied the area around the station and the thin coastal strip to the east, as far as the mouth of the Simami Creek and the western end of the old strip. Juropa Point is about halfway between the government station and the mouth of Simami Creek, Juropa Creek discharges to the sea on the western side of Juropa Point. On the 18th of November, the 32nd Division was approaching the Buna positions. The I-128 th Battalion was nearing the Juropa Plantation along the coastal path. The I-126 th Battalion, with the 2 6th Independent Company and a detached company of the 128th Battalion, were well behind following the same route, and arrived on the 20th of November. The 3rd-128 th Battalion was approaching the strips on the track from Semim. The 2nd-128 th Battalion was close behind. The remaining two battalions of the 126th Regiment were at Inoda, well inland and had been tasked, to engage the western flank of the Buna position. On the 19th of November, these two battalions were placed under command of the 7th Division, by order of Herring, Gork New Guinea Force, who was in immediate command of the two divisions. This was to concentrate maximum force against the main Japanese position around Sanananda. The two Australian brigades had been substantially depleted by the fighting along the Kokoda track, and were approximately one-third of their establishment strength. Harding was put out by this decision. Not only did it alienate a large part of his command but it meant a major adjustment to his plans just as he was about to engage the Japanese. The left flank task was reassigned to the 2nd-128 th Battalion. This left the I-126 th Battalion, well to the rear, as the only reserve. Movement between the two flanks entailed a two-day march. With only two mountain howitzers in support, Harding proceeded with the attack of the 19th of November on the eastern flank. The attacks were met with intense fire from the Japanese defenders and quickly faltered with no gain. The early movements of battalions blurred the assignment of tasks against the eastern and western flanks on the basis of regimental commands. The force attacking the Japanese western flank was designated a banner force. The concentration to the east, around Cape Endiadir and the two strips, was called Warren Force. The next day, a further attack was pressed with support from bombers and the mountain howitzers. About 100 yards was gained on the coastal strip, but the 3rd-128 th was still held up in front of the bridge. An attack on the 21st was to be an all out effort. The I-126 th and 2 th th independent company had arrived and were committed to the attack between the coast and the eastern end of the new strip. I-128 th against the coast, I-126 th in the center and 2 6th independent company on the left at the eastern end of the strip. Three bombing missions had been ordered in support of the attack. The orders for the attack had not been received before the first mission in the morning. The second mission was cancelled, due to weather. The attack proceeded with the third that arrived at 3.57 p.m. Both bombing missions caused Allied casualties, 10 killed and 14 wounded in total. The bombing failed to neutralize the Japanese positions and disrupted the attackers. The attack resulted in no appreciable gain by the forces at either end of the new strip. 
By the 26th of November, artillery support for the division had increased from the two mountain howitzers to include six 25-pounders. Warren Force was to concentrate its efforts against the eastern end of the news strip. On the 22nd, the 3rd 128th th was moved to there, leaving a company to guard the Simony track. The front was adjusted, with 3 128th th taking the right, seaward flank. I 126th th remained in the center, with the 26th Independent Company to the left. Here, the coast ran south to north toward Cape Endiadia so that the axis of advance toward the Cape was north. The I-128 th was positioned behind the I-126 th. It was tasked to move through the I-128 th west, along the edge of the new strip. The I-128 th was to advance northwest and the 3rd-128 th on a northerly axis. This plan, with attacking troops moving on three different axes, was perhaps altogether too complex. The attack was preceded with strafing by P 40s and bowfighters, while A 20s bombed to the rear. Some 50 aircraft participated. This was followed by half an hour of artillery bombardment. The massed fire failed to suppress the Japanese position and the attack was met with heavy fire. The advance of the I 126th was misdirected, opening a gap in the left flank. The I 126th was recalled to seal the flank. The attack ended without significant gain as Japanese aircraft from Ley strafed the Americans. An attack on 30 November was to coincide with one by Urbana Force. While the I 126th made some progress along the axis of the new strip, the day again ended without significant progress. Through the course of these events, some small gains had been made by small attacks and infiltration. Nevertheless, MacArthur became increasingly impatient with Harding's efforts and the lack of progress by the 32nd Division. Chapter 6, Section 2, Buna Station, Urbana Force The 2nd-128 th, advancing along the track from Ango, made contact with the Japanese defenders around midday on 21 November. Reconnoitering the flanks, the Americans plunged into a mire of swamp. The 2nd-126 th was released by 7th Division on the 22nd and linked up with the 2nd-128 th on the morning of the 23rd. An attack on the 24th was pressed by these battalions against the flanks and front of the triangle. It was to be supported by artillery and aerial bombing but the latter did not eventuate. An allied fighter strafed the force headquarters. The right flank emerged from the swamp, and moved about 200 yards across open kunai before being caught exposed and came under heavy fire. The left and center fared little better and no gain was made. A banner force concentrated its efforts against the left flank. The plan for the 30th of November was to attack on a wide front from the apex of the triangle toward Buna village, having first paralleled the Japanese defenses. Little real headway was made against the defenders but at the end of the day, E Company of the 2nd-126 th was short of the village by about 100 yards and F Company of the 2nd-128 th had made a wide flanking move to reach Saiwari village, cutting land communication between Buna and Sanananda. By this time, Losses for the 32nd Division were 492 men. The following day saw an attempt against the village with some minor success. Though the main attack faltered, G Company, 2 slash 126 th advanced to Entrance Creek after clearing a command post and several bunkers. Chapter 6, Section 3, Harding Replaced Following the inspection of the 2nd of December, Eichelberger relieved Harding, replacing him with the division's artillery commander, Brigadier General Waldron. He also sacked the regimental commanders and most battalion commanders and ordered improvements in food and medical supplies. Through the moves to the beachheads and during the fighting the division had become badly intermixed. 
many companies had been separated from their parent battalions. Eichelberger halted operations on the Buna front for two days to allow units to reorganize. Eichelberger set about restoring the flagging confidence of his men, conspicuously wearing the three stars on his collar among the frontline troops, ignoring the convention of removing insignia at the front so as to not attract the enemy. He and his staff regularly came under fire, once from only fifteen yards, but he insisted on being present with his forward troops to quietly urge them in their efforts. He expected the same leadership from his officers at every level. Waldron was injured on the 5th of December, accompanying Eichelberger near the front and was replaced by Brigadier General Byers. An article in Time magazine from September 1945 records that some of the 32nd's officers privately denounced Eichelberger as ruthless, Prussian. The men of the 32nd, called their division cemetery Eichelberger Square. Chapter 6, Section 4, Breakthrough at Buna Village On 5 December, a banner force pressed an attack on Buna Village from the south with four companies. P-40 Kitty Hawks supported by attacking the station, to disrupt any attempt to reinforce the village. The attacks by the flank companies faltered while the centre advanced with limited success. On the centre-right, Staff Sergeant Herman Butcher, a platoon commander in H Company, 126th Infantry, leading 18 men, was able to drive to the sea. Butcher and his troops fought off attacks for seven days during which he was wounded twice before he was relieved. Australian war correspondent George Johnston wrote in Time magazine on 20 September 1943, by a conservative count, Butcher and his 12 men, killed more than 120 Japs. Butcher had turned the tide of the battle at Buna. His platoon's efforts cut off the Japanese in Buna village from supply and reinforcements, being already isolated on the western flank. It provided the impetus for the ultimate capture of the village. Butcher was awarded a battlefield commission to the rank of captain and the first of two distinguished service crosses. A plaque was later placed at the entrance to Buna village in memory of his actions that day. On this same day, Bren carriers were to spearhead an unsuccessful attack on the Warren Force front. Subsequent actions on the Urbana front were to consolidate the gain made by Butcher. For the next week, activity on both flanks at Buna was mainly restricted to infiltration and harassing artillery fire. On the 11th of December, the 3rd 127 th having arrived at Dobadura two days earlier, took over forward positions occupied by 2-126th. In the morning of 14 December, after concentrated mortar fire, the 3rd-127th advanced on the village but the defenders had already fled. The only positions to the west of Entrance Creek that remained were at the Coconut Grove. This was cleared by the 2nd-128th with attacks on 16 and the 17th of November. Chapter 6, Section 5, San Ananda Track On the morning of the 20th of November, the 16th Brigade, having advanced from Soputa on the San Ananda Track, was approaching the vicinity of two track junctions that left the main track for Cape Killerton. The two over one battalion in the lead, came under small arms and artillery fire and the battalion deployed to the flanks. Two companies under Captain Basil Cattens were tasked to make a broad left flanking maneuver around the Japanese positions astride the road. The remainder of the brigade adjusted itself in support. Cattens force skirted the Japanese forward positions and attacked the main Japanese position astride the road as evening approached. Cattens force fought a desperate action through the night and the day of the 21st of November while the rest of the battalion pressed forward against Japanese positions that were threatened by Cattens' maneuver. The defenders fell back through the night and into the morning. By 8.30 a.m. on the 21st of November, the two halves and two TH-3RD battalion moved through the forward companies of the two over one. Catton's force had made a small salient in the main Japanese defences. The two-thirds pressed forward to relieve Catton's by the early evening, taking position immediately to Catton's rear, while his force vacated the position it had been holding. While this seemed prudent at the time, 
maintaining the position may have been advantageous for subsequent operations. In Catton's initial force of 91 all ranks, five officers and 26 other ranks had been killed and two officers and 34 other ranks had been wounded. The gun, the forward positions immediately delaying the brigade's advance and a further defensive position in between were secured by this action. The Japanese positions were now just north of the first track junction but denied the use of this track to Cape Killerton. To either flank was thick jungle and swamp, dispersed through the area were relatively open patches of kunai grass. One patch was immediately forward of the Japanese positions encountered by the 2 over 1 battalion on the 20th of November. After long fighting along the Kokoda track, the effective strength of the brigade had been reduced to less than the equivalent of a battalion. The American 3-126th battalion was brought forward on the 22nd of November to make a similar left flank maneuver to Catton's. It was tasked to secure the Soputa Sanananda Cape Killerton track junction to the front of 16th Brigade. After a false start on the 23rd of November, the American attack commenced the following day. On the 30th of November, after nearly a week of indecisive skirmishing through the bush, the position which was to become known as Huggins Roadblock was established on the Sanananda track, just south of the second Cape Killerton track junction. The position had an initial strength of about 250 men. Chapter 6, Section 6, Ghana On the 19th of November, the 25th Brigade approached Ghana village on the track from Jumbura. Just south of the village, the passage of a patrol of the 233rds through a large patch of kunai was being disputed by some Japanese riflemen. The 231sts pushed through the kunai and then came under small arms fire from the direction of the village and deployed to the flanks. The Japanese defense was tenacious and running short of ammunition, the battalion broke contact just before midnight. Having received supplies at Wariopa on the 13th of November, the brigade was on the last of its emergency rations and required ammunition. Supplies arrived on the 21st of November and an attack was planned for the following day, where the 233rd's battalion was to advance on the village. Lieutenant Haddy's 216th Chaforce Company, was now under command of the 231st's battalion, having taken up a position just west of the village and gone a creek dot as the 233rd's battalion, advanced and met strong resistance, the 231st's battalion worked around to the east, to the beach and attacked on a narrow front, confined by beach and swamp on either flank. At the forward Japanese positions, it was repulsed by heavy enfilade fire. The 225th Battalion was to push through the 231st's battalion on the 23rd of November to renew the attack from the east. The battalion made a small gain before being held and was forced to withdraw. The village was bombed on the 24th of November and the 3rd Battalion attacked on the afternoon of the 25th of November, from the southwest, with mortars and artillery in support. After a small advance, the battalion was held up by a Japanese defensive position. The Japanese at Ghana had been aggressive in their defense. In the evening of the 26th of November, the 233rds, astride the main track, was counter-attacked by the defenders. By these events, the offensive capacity of the 25th Brigade was exhausted. The brigade had fought the Japanese the length of the Kokoda track. It had been reinforced by the 3rd Battalion and the three Chaforce companies. The four battalions totaled just over the strength of a battalion, and the Chaforce companies about one-third of a battalion. The 21st Brigade, though barely 1,000 strong, was shortly to arrive and was assigned the task of capturing Ghana village with the 25th Brigade in support, recent reinforcements had remained in Port Moresby for further training. An attack was ordered for the 29th of November, even though the last of the brigade's battalions was not due until the following day, possibly because of intelligence indicating the imminent arrival of Japanese reinforcements. The 214th Battalion was to form up at Point Y, on the eastern flank and attack along the coastal strip from Point X, just west of Small Creek, about 1,000 yards from the village, the attack was to be preceded by an air raid. 
A clearing patrol failed to identify strong Japanese positions between Point Y and Point X and the 214th Battalion was heavily engaged as it proceeded to the line of departure. The attack was modified, with the 227th Battalion to move directly to Point X and take over the task against the village. The 214th Battalion was to concentrate on the force about Small Creek, having skirted a patch of Kunai, it was to move easterly from Point Y, then to Point Z on the coast, to attack from there. Both attacking battalions met determined resistance and made small gains that day. The 216th Battalion arrived to join the fighting the following day. It was deployed to protect the eastern flank and contributed two companies to a renewed attack against the village. The attacks were met with machine gun fire and while they failed to make any gain, the 214th Battalion was able to clear the beach positions. A renewed attack followed on the 1st of December and the attackers were able to enter the village but in the face of counter-attacks, were unable to consolidate their gains. While the remaining force maintained pressure on the village, the 214th Battalion was tasked to press east, toward San Ananda. It encountered no resistance except from the impenetrable swamp and an overzealous member of the RAF, who strafed the whole unit. The 21st Brigade, in five days of fighting, had lost 340 casualties, over a third of its strength. The 30th Brigade was then moving to the beachheads and the 39th Battalion, which had been first to meet the advance of the Japanese across the Kokoda track, was detached to the 21st Brigade. Though then inexperienced, it had accounted for itself well and was ably led by Hona. The 25th Brigade was relieved and moved to Port Moresby from 4 December. The Che Force companies remained. The 216th and 2th 27th th, so depleted by the recent fighting, were amalgamated into a composite battalion under Lieutenant Colonel Albert Caro. A fresh attack on 6 December, with the 39th Battalion from the south and the composite battalion along the coast quickly bogged down. An assault was planned for the 8th of December, with the main thrust to be provided by the 39th Battalion. This was Brigadier Ivan Doherty's last throw at taking Ghana. If unsuccessful, Vasey had decided to contain Ghana while concentrating on San Ananda. Aerial bombardment mainly fell on the Australian positions by mistake, and the attack was postponed until a 250-round artillery bombardment was fired with delay fuses. Honor committed his battalion to attack under the artillery barrage, calculating that his troops would maintain the attack under their own fire and that the barrage would give them an advantage to succeed. The delay fuses were more effective against the Japanese positions and less likely to inflict casualties in the attacking force, compared with instantaneous fuses. The day closed with the Japanese position reduced to a small enclave that was taken the following day, after which Honor sent Doherty the message, gone has gone. Chapter 6, Section 7, West of Ghana, Hadi's Village Hadi's 216th Che Force Company had been positioned on the west bank of Ghana Creek since 21 November and had dwindled to a strength of 45 all ranks. The company had been protecting the west flank and harassing the Japanese in the village. On 30 November, a Che Force patrol, at Hadi's village, a little east of the Amboga River, repulsed a Japanese force of between 150 and 200 men attempting to infiltrate east in support of the beachheads. The Japanese maintain a strong presence in the area and there was an engagement on 7 December. A Japanese force of 400 to 500 men was operating in the area. Hadi, covering the withdrawal of his patrol from the village was killed. The 214th Battalion was tasked to protect this flank by patrolling to prevent the Japanese from reinforcing the beachheads. On 10 December, the 39th Battalion patrolled by a slightly inland route toward Hadi's village and met firm resistance from an outer perimeter of defenders to the south of the village. They deployed and engaged the Japanese occupying the village while the 214th Battalion, which had been operating from a firm base about halfway between Ghana and the village, moved along the coast to join the 39th Battalion. En route, on the 11th of December, 
it met stiff resistance from Japanese that had occupied a small cluster of huts and its advance toward Hadi's village was slowed by a determined defense. What remained of the 214th Battalion was placed under Honor's command and a concerted attack against the village was made on 16 December. Fighting continued until the village was captured on the morning of 18 December. There were 170 defenders buried after the attack but captured documents indicated a larger force had occupied the village and wounded had been evacuated prior to the final battle. The occupiers were from the Japanese 3-170th Infantry Regiment that had landed near the mouth of the Kumasi River in early December. After this, the Japanese forces west of the beachheads made no further serious push against the Allied western flank but Vasey maintained a force in and around Ghana to secure this flank, and to contain the Japanese defenders at the beachheads. Chapter 6 Section 8 Tanks at Buna On 14 December, the 2 9th Battalion of the Australian 18th Brigade arrived at Oro Bay. The brigade was attached to the 32nd Division to take over the Warren Force area, with the American units, I-126th, I-128th and 3-128th battalions, placed under command. The 2 9th Battalion attacked on 18 December, on a front extending from the eastern end of the new strip to the coast, pivoting on its left flank. The attack was supported by seven M3 tanks of the 2-6th Armoured Regiment and an 8th in reserve. The first phase was the capture of the Duropa Plantation and the area beyond bordered by the Simami Creek. At the end of the first day, the 2 9th Battalion had lost 11 officers and 160 other ranks, two tanks had been destroyed and one damaged but the right flank had been advanced to about 400 yards west of Cape Endiadir and the front now ran north from the eastern end of the new strip, a substantial gain and on the 19th of December, the brigade consolidated. It was a spectacular and dramatic assault, and a brave one. From the new strip to the sea was about half a mile. American troops wheeled to the west in support, and other Americans were assigned to mopping up duties. But behind the tanks went the fresh and jaunty Aussie veterans, tall, moustached, erect, with their blazing Tommy guns pinging before them. Concealed Japanese positions, which were even more formidable than our patrols had indicated, burst into flame. There was the greasy smell of tracer fire, and heavy machine gun fire from barricades and entrenchments. Steadily tanks and infantrymen advanced through the spare, high coconut trees, seemingly impervious to the heavy opposition. The Japanese had abandoned their positions along the new strip and forward of the bridge, which the I-128th and I-126th were able to occupy. In an attack on 20 December, the 2 9th Battalion was strengthened by a company of the 2 10th Battalion. This battalion had embarked at Pork Harbor on the 17th of December. On the 20th of December, the I-126th and then a detachment of the 114th Engineer Battalion, tried to force the creek at the bridge but failed. On the following day, the 2 10th Battalion and the two battalions of the 128th Infantry Regiment were tasked with making a crossing of the creek. The 2 10th Battalion, which had concentrated at the western end of the new strip, achieved this on the 22nd of December about 500 yards west of the bridge, close to where the creek returned from making a sharp U toward the Cape. Having made the crossing in force on the 23rd, the 2 tenths battalion then swung left back toward the bridge to occupy the bridgehead by midday with few casualties. The American engineers quickly set about making repairs while the I-126th battalion crossed the creek to take up the left flank. By the end of the day, the 2 tenths battalion had advanced about 400 yards along the northern side of the old strip from where it had crossed the creek. From there, the front swept back and along the fringe of the swamp toward the bridge. Phase 1 of Wooten's plan had concluded after six days of hard fighting. On 24 December, the 2 tenths battalion with the I-126th battalion were to attack up the old strip. 
despite the four tanks allocated to support the attack being destroyed by a concealed anti-aircraft gun at the outset, the right flank was able to advance about 600 yards, having approached the fringe of the coconut plantation that extended around the coast from the western end of the old strip. The I-128th Battalion had also joined the fighting along the old strip that day. The Australians were being employed as shock troops and relied on the Americans to clear behind them as they advanced. The 3rd 128th Battalion had similarly supported the 29th Battalion. On 25 December, an advance by infiltration was attempted but two anti-aircraft guns and their supporting defences were encountered. On 26 December, the first fell silent, out of ammunition and was overrun by the Americans. The second gun and supporting positions only fell after a bitter struggle. The impetus for the advance that day had been held by strongly contested positions which ultimately yielded to the tenacity of the attackers, who suffered heavily without the benefit of supporting tanks. On 27 December the attackers consolidated the position at the end of the old strip. By 28 December, most of the Japanese were contained in the coastal strip of coconut plantation from the Simami Creek at the end of the old strip de Jeropa Creek, about half a mile from the coast. A plan for 28 December to squeeze the Japanese with a pivot from each flank was a costly failure and during the evening, the right flank was counter-attacked with many casualties, while the Japanese raided American positions in depth. An attack was planned for 29 December, with newly arrived tanks. The 2 tenths Battalion was strengthened by a company of the 2 ninths Battalion but the attack became a fiasco, when the tanks attacked their own troops stopped the 2 twelfths Battalion was arriving and was tasked to clear the strip of coconut plantation in an attack on 1 January, with 6 tanks supporting and 3 in reserve. By this time, the 3rd 128th Battalion had been relieved by the I-126th Battalion. The fighting continued through the day. The last post was reduced by 9.55 am on 2 January, and sporadic fighting continued into the afternoon as the position was cleared. The 2 12ths Battalion lost 12 officers and 179 other ranks in these two days of fighting. The 18th Brigade lost 55 officers and 808 other ranks since being committed on 18 December. Chapter 6, Section 9, Huggins Roadblock The bulk of the force occupying the roadblock on the San Ananda track consisted of I Company, 3-126th Battalion, and the Regimental Anti-Tank Company, with Captain John Shirley in command. The forward Japanese positions had been enveloped but not isolated by allied positions which resembled a horseshoe with the ends pointing northward and the roadblock between the two ends. Cannon Company and K Company, at the western end of the horseshoe, were about 1,400 yards west of the roadblock. Initially, this provided a base from which to supply the roadblock position. Huggins was leading a ration party to the roadblock on 1 December when, shortly after his arrival, Shirley was killed. Huggins then took command of the force but was wounded and evacuated from the position on 8 December. The Americans mounted an attack against the enveloped Japanese positions on 5 December without success. It became apparent that reinforcements were needed and the Australian 30th Brigade was assigned this task for 7 December. The 49th Battalion was allocated the right side of the track and was to attack in the morning, while the 55th-53rd, allocated the left side, were to attack in the afternoon. Both attacks made little gain for heavy casualties, though, the 49th Battalion did link with parts of the two halves battalion in positions near the far right end of the horseshoe of positions. Until mid-December and the arrival of the 2 7th Cavalry Regiment and the 36th Battalion, the forces deployed on the track adopted a policy of patrolling and infiltrating the Japanese positions. Chapter 6, Section 10, James's Roadblock The 36th Battalion took over positions astride the track on 18 December, with the 55th-53rd and 49th Battalions shuffling left and right respectively. 
attacks were to be made by these two battalions the following day against the forward Japanese positions, with the 36th in reserve. The 2 7th Cavalry Regiment had circled left to advance to Huggins that night, to launch an attack in the morning along the track and press on to San Ananda. Having lost many of its junior leaders, the attack by the 55th-53 RD Battalion was soon held. The 49th Battalion was able to push forward, mainly along the Japanese flank, to the vicinity of the roadblock position. Renewed attacks by the 49th Battalion with support from part of the 36th Battalion were held up. An attempt by the 36th Battalion on 21 December to push through from positions gained by the 49th Battalion made little progress. The 2 7th Cavalry Regiment was able to advance about 450 yards before meeting strong resistance, which also threatened the flanks of its advance. By nightfall, Captain James, with about 100 men was able to establish a perimeter about 400 yards from Huggins. Most of the remaining force was able to fall back to Huggins. The attacking forces continued to patrol vigorously on 20 and the 21st of December. While the attacks failed to capture the forward position or achieve a breakthrough along the track, they isolated a further cluster of Japanese posts between Huggins and the fresh roadblock position occupied by James. There was now also a line of posts along the eastern flank to Huggins, manned by the 49th Battalion. This then became the line of communication and supply for the roadblock positions. It was clear that the reinforcements were insufficient to force a decision on the San Ananda track. There were no more Australian forces available for the beachheads unless the defences elsewhere in New Guinea were stripped. The US 163rd Infantry Regiment was en route to the beachheads and the 18th Brigade, with the tanks of the 2-6th Armoured Regiment, would be released from the 32nd Division when Buna fell. This would not relieve the situation on the San Ananda track until early in the new year and patrolling continued during this lull. Chapter 6, Section 11, Buna Government Station Falls after the fall of Buna village on 14 December, the 2nd-128 TH battalion cleared the coconut grove by noon on 17 December, having attacked the day before. On 18 December, an attempt was made by the 3rd-128 TH battalion to advance on the government station by crossing to Musita Island. The advance across the island was unopposed but was driven back off the island by heavy fire as it attempted to cross the bridge at the eastern end. An attempt by the 2nd-126 th Battalion was made on the triangle on 19 December from near the bridge over Entrance Creek, driving south but was a costly failure. On 20 December, the 2nd-127 th Battalion crossed the creek at the Coconut Grove under cover of smoke but the attack became confused and fizzled out, Urbana force had made no progress in three days. A bridgehead was to be made across Entrance Creek, about halfway between the island and the Triangle, with the attack pressing through the government gardens and bypassing the Triangle. A crossing was made by the 3rd-127 th Battalion in assault boats on the night of 21 December and a bridge was built by which five companies were able to cross on 24 December. A bridge at the southwest end of Musita Island was repaired and the occupation of the island by midday on 23 December was uneventful. An advance across the government gardens along an axis slightly north of east on 24 December was planned and the attack became a small unit action by companies without a clear distinction between battalions. On 24 December, the right and centre attacks bogged down. However, on the left, a platoon advanced to the sea but when it found itself isolated, out of contact and under fire from its own guns, it was forced to withdraw. A renewed effort was joined by parts of the I-127th Battalion which was just arriving. The attack on 25 December produced a similar result to the previous day but this time, two companies were able to establish a perimeter about 300 yards from the sea and 600 yards from the government station. The position was isolated and strongly contested by the Japanese. By 28 December, 
the position had been consolidated and progress had been made in the center and on the right. By this time, it had been found that the Japanese had abandoned the triangle. Also on the 28th of December, the 3rd-128 TH Battalion tried to force a bridgehead from Musita Island in assault boats but this failed when the artillery cover lifted while the boats were in midstream. On the night of the 29th of December, it was discovered that the Japanese were no longer contesting an approach to the government station across the spit seaward of Musita Island. Plans were made to exploit this with an attack early on the 31st of December, approaching from the spit and from the bridge on Musita Island. Irresponsible firing alerted the Japanese of the approach along the spit, and the inexperienced company of the 2nd-127 th Battalion broke under fire after the company commander was wounded. Disaster was averted by the intervention of the regimental commander, Colonel Groose, who rallied the troops. The second of the companies committed along this axis was more resolute and a beachhead was secured. On the 1st of January 1943, urban force attacked the government station and by the 2nd of January, some Japanese troops were breaking to the sea. By mid-afternoon, the advances from the coast and the bridge had met. Final positions were captured later that afternoon and a link was made with the Australians on the right flank. Chapter 6, Section 12, Realignment of Allied Forces With the fall of Buna, the 32nd Division was to press on against the Japanese at Sanananda Jirua from the east while the 18th Brigade and tanks of the 2-6th Armoured Regiment were to join the 7th Division at the Sanananda track, with the US 163rd Infantry Regiment, was also joining at the track. On the 22nd of December, the headquarters of the 21st Brigade and the 39th Battalion moved from Ghana to the Sanananda track, where the 49th Battalion and 2 7th Cavalry Regiment came under command and the 39th Battalion relieved the Americans occupying Huggins Roadblock. The 8th Battalions properly belonging to the Brigade remained in the Ghana area, to be known as Goforce, under command of Lt. Col. Challen. The Americans of the 126th Infantry Regiment that remained were under command of the 30th Brigade but were returned to the 32nd Division at Boone on 9 January. Brigadier Porter, commanding the 30th Brigade wrote to Eichelberger. I am taking the opportunity offered by Major Borum's return to you to express my appreciation of what the men of your division who have been under my command have done to assist our efforts on the Sanananda Road. By now it is realized that greater difficulties presented themselves here than were foreseen, and the men of your division probably bore most of them, your men are worthy comrades and stout hearts. I trust that they will have the opportunity to rebuild their depleted ranks in the very near future. With their present fund of experience they will rebuild into a formidable force. On the night of 2 the 3rd of January, with the arrival of the 163rd Regiment, there was a general reshuffle. The Americans took over the positions then held by the Australians under command of the 21st Brigade. These Australian units then came under command of the 30th Brigade and relieved the 36th and 55th-53 RD battalions, which were placed under command of the newly arrived headquarters, 14th Brigade which took over the responsibilities of Goforce. Thus relieved, the 21st Brigade and its 8th Battalions returned to Port Moresby. On the morning of 10 January, the 18th Brigade took the 2 7th Cavalry Regiment under command and occupied the positions held by the 39th and 49th Battalions of the 30th Brigade, in preparation for an attack on 12 January. Chapter 6, Section 13, Rankin Roadblock Leading up to this, Colonel Doe, commanding the 163rd Infantry Regiment, tried to force the Japanese positions between the two roadblocks. The attack by the I-163 RD Battalion on 8 January was fiercely met and thrown back by the defenders. On 9 January, the 2nd-163 RD Battalion deployed through Huggins to a position on the Killerton track. The battalion established a roadblock in close contact with Japanese positions to the south. This position was slightly south of west from Huggins and was known as Rankin, after the battalion commander. Chapter 6, Section 14, 
tanks at San Ananda track. On 12 January, the two 9th and 2th-12th battalions, each reinforced with a company from the 2 tenths battalion attacked the forward Japanese positions along the San Ananda track. Three tanks were allocated to support the attack with one in reserve. Unable to maneuver, the tanks were quickly knocked out by a concealed gun and the attack was repulsed, particularly by the Japanese on the left in the front of the 2 12th battalion but the Japanese abandoned the forward positions that had barred the track to Cape Killerton. The positions south of Huggins were abandoned over the nights of 12 and the 13th of January. Chapter 6 Section 15 Tarakena. The 127th Regiment had been tasked to advance along the coast toward San Ananda Jirua from Buna and Beachhead, had been established at Saiwari, but at dusk on 4 January, the Japanese attacked the advanced American position forward of the village, forcing them back. Two companies crossed Saiwari Creek on the morning of 5 January and advanced toward Turakana, against a Japanese delaying action reaching the village on the evening of the 8th of January. The fast-flowing Conombi Creek, immediately west of the village was covered by fire and a significant obstacle to any further advance. A bridgehead was secured by the 10th of January but the country beyond was impassable because at high tide, the ocean and swamp merged. The advance by the 32nd Division paused until 15 January. Chapter 6 Section 16 Cape Killerton, San Ananda, and Jirua. The 18th Brigade advanced toward Cape Killerton on the morning of 15 January, with the two tenths leading but the going became very heavy as the track petered into swamp. The beach was reached the next day and Y Point by that evening, where the battalion encountered the outer defences of a strong position. The 2nd-163 RD, leaving Rankin, followed in the wake of the 18th Brigade. It left the Killerton track at the Coconut Grove to find the second, more easterly Killerton track. On the 16th of January, it moved south along the second track to support of the rest of the regiment. It approached the Japanese positions near James's, from the rear and linked with the I-163RD battalion. The two twelfths struck east from the Coconut Grove on the Killerton track for the main San Ananda track to press along the track to San Ananda. It reached this by 11.30 on 17 January. The two ninths struck east from the Killerton track, through the village. It paralleled the coast before striking northeast for San Ananda, bypassing the Japanese coast defenses east of Y Point. It halted just short of the San Ananda village positions for the night. The positions between Huggins and James's were reduced on 16 January by the 163rd Infantry Regiment. It also enveloped the Japanese positions to the front of James's. This was the last of the cluster that had held the advance of the Australians along the track. The 2nd-163 RD, having patrolled back along the 2nd Killerton track to meet with the rest of the regiment, skirted east to the main San Ananda track and advanced along this until it linked with the 2 twelfths battalion. Having found the track clear, it returned to the regiment, which was detained by the task before it until 22 January. On the morning of 18 January, the 2 ninths battalion approached San Ananda village through swamp from the southwest. This unlikely approach was not strongly defended and the village fell by 1 p.m. The battalion then cleared San Ananda Point, and east the Jirua River before nightfall. The 127th Infantry Regiment, having paused at Conombi Creek recommenced its advance on 16 January and made steady progress, taking Jirua on 21 January and linked with the Australians already on the Jirua River. By the evening of 17 January, the 2 12th Battalion was astride the San Ananda track and had linked with A Company of the 2 10th Battalion that had been directed to patrol to the track from Killerton Village earlier. On 18 January, it advanced north toward San Ananda but the battalion met determined resistance that could not be overcome that day despite three attacks. On 19 January, positions on the western side of the track were taken by A Company of the 2 10th Battalion, who were detached, temporarily to the 2 twelfths Battalion. Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Arnold, commanding the 2 twelfths Battalion, 
described this feat as one of the outstanding features of this phase of the campaign. The battalion was able to link with a company of the 2-9th Battalion that had been lending assistance from the north end of the track. Defenses on the eastern side of the track resisted the efforts of the attackers that day and the following but on the morning of the 21st of January, only the sick and wounded manned the position and offered little resistance. The 2 tenths Battalion confronted stubborn resistance in its advance from Y Point, compounded by extremely difficult terrain. The strip separating sea from swamp was only a few feet wide at high tide and not much more at low tide. Progress was painfully slow, with the only effective fire support coming from mortars and this was limited since the ammunition had to be man-packed forward. Having cleared San Ananda, the 2 ninths Battalion pushed west in support of the 2 tenths Battalion, initially with one company. By the 20th of January, only 300 yards separated the two battalions but it was not until 1.15 p.m. on the 22nd of January that it was reported that the forces had joined and organized resistance had ended. Chapter 7, Aftermath Although the main fighting was over, significant numbers of Japanese remained at large about the beachheads and had to be dealt with over the following days. The 14th Brigade clashed sharply with bands of fugitives in the Amboga River area. The remaining regiments of the U.S. 41st Division were moved forward to relieve the depleted Allied forces and had the remnants of the Japanese forces around the Kumasi River to deal with. Dobaduro was developed as a major forward air base, supported by improved harbor facilities at Oro Bay. Australian battle casualties were 3,471 with 1,204 killed in action or died of wounds and 66 missing, presumed, dead. This does not include those who were evacuated sick. For a total strength of 13,645, American ground forces suffered 671 killed in action, 116 other deaths, 2,172 wounded in action and 7,926 for a total of 10,879. The 163rd Infantry Regiment sustained 88 killed in action and 238 wounded. Overall, about 60,000 Americans fought on Guadalcanal, suffering 5,845 casualties, including 1,600 killed in action. On Papua more than 33,000 Americans and Australians fought, and they suffered 8,546 casualties, of whom 3,095 were killed. On Guadalcanal, 1 in 37 died, while troops in New Guinea had a 1 in 11 chance of dying. In his book, Our Jungle Road to Tokyo, written in 1950, Eichelberger wrote, Buna was, bought at a substantial price in death, wounds, disease, despair, and human suffering. No one who fought there, however hard he tries, will ever forget it. Fatalities, he concluded, closely approach, percentage-wise, the heaviest losses in our Civil War battles. He also commented, I am a reasonably unimaginative man, but Buna is still to me, in retrospect, a nightmare. This long after, I can still remember every day and most of the nights. Historian Stanley Falk agreed, writing that the Popoan campaign was one of the costliest allied victories of the Pacific War in terms of casualties per troops committed. The two 126th was especially hard hit. The fighting on the San Ananda track had reduced their strength of over 1,300 to 158. During Kokoda, Harai had been ordered to withdraw or euphemistically, according to Bullard, to advance in another direction. At Gerari, the well-ordered withdrawal collapsed under the pressure applied by the 7th Division. Vasey wrote of this, We have just proved he does not like being attacked from all directions any more than we do, absolutely rooted the Jap. For the defense of Buna, orders were given by the Japanese that, it is essential for the execution of future operations that the Buna area be secured. There, Vasey observes, the Jap is being more stubborn and tiresome than I thought and I fear a war of attrition is taking place on this front. The Jap won't go till he is killed and in the process he is inflicting many casualties on us. He went on to write, 
I had no idea that the Japanese, or anyone, could be as obstinate and stubborn, as he has proved to be. I compared our situation now to Crete reversed, but unfortunately the Japanese is not playing by our rules. The resolve and tenacity of the Japanese defenders was, to Western perceptions, unprecedented to the point of being fanatical, and had not previously been encountered. It was to mark the conduct of further battles throughout the war. Estimating the Japanese losses is as difficult as determining the strength of their force. Japanese sources give their losses at about 8,000. More than 200 prisoners, including 159 Japanese, were taken at Gona and Sanananda. At Buna, only 50 prisoners, mostly non Japanese laborers, were taken. However, the victory, was not as complete as could be desired, as many of the able-bodied Japanese troops escaped. Authors including McCarthy and Macaulay have questioned whether it was necessary to engage the Japanese in a costly battle or whether they could have been contained and reduced by starvation. Both concluded that a battle was necessary and that a victory was necessary for the Allies and not just MacArthur. Condon Rao and Cowdery have a similar position but a different rationale, citing Eichelberger, who wrote that disease was a surer and more deadly peril to us than enemy marksmanship. We had to whip the Japanese before the malarial mosquito whipped us. However, it is difficult not to question whether this victory could have been achieved without the loss that was incurred. It is clear that undue pressure for haste exacerbated the Allies' losses. It is also apparent that the process of pinching off or infiltrating the Japanese defenses produced results where repeated assaults failed to produce any gain. The losses suffered by the Australian forces limited their offensive capacity for months following the battle. There were many valuable, albeit costly lessons gained through the campaign. It proved to be a massive learning experience for the Allies. These lessons came to form the core of doctrines and tactics employed by the Australian Army throughout the remainder of the war. Chapter 7 Section 1 Recognition and Memorials For eligible Australian units, the Battle on Abuna Gona was bestowed. Subsidiary honours were also bestowed for Gona, Sanananda Road, Amboga River, Cape Endiadia Sinami Creek, and Sanananda Cape Killerton. 1st Sergeant Elmer J. Burr and Sergeant Kenneth E. Grunert were later posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for their actions in the Battle of Buna Gona. Herman Butcher was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross twice. A brass memorial plaque was placed at the site of the Huggins Roadblock after the war. The Japanese also erected a monument commemorating their soldiers' struggle. The war dead from Kochi Ken lies here. 1974 July Governor of Kochi, Kochi Ken, Masumi Mizabuchi, representative of bereaved New Guinea society. Australian units placed a plaque in memory of their fallen comrades. To the memory of the 161 members of the 53, 55, 55 53 Australian Infantry Battalion who gave their lives in Papua New Guinea 1942-1945.